Amy. <laughs> We're pitching Adobe as a buy for the technology sector. So Adobe is one of the largest and most diversified software companies in the world. They operate in the Americas, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and the Asia Pacific. Um, they have the what's now called the Creative Cloud, which is the commonly known programs like Photoshop, Illustrator, and Acrobat. They have many other products that like Dreamweaver, Animate Bridge, Premiere Pro, that if you're trying to create something, Adobe has a software. So some of the highlights, like the big three things why we think Adobe is a good buy is they increased their revenue by 25% uh, within the last, uh, sorry, 25% year to date compared to with last year, went up about $2 million. They have really aggressive acquisitions of Magneto and Marketo for 1.6 bill and 4.7 respectively. And these help make Adobe an all-in-one shop for anything that any of their customers need to do. They're also drastically decreasing their long-term debt by 76%. So they cut off almost $4 million in long-term debt. This will help them with operating flexibility and help them in the long run in case anything goes wrong in the world. So some of the major acquisitions we just mentioned um, make Adobe a one-stop shop for design-based business and their needs. Um, Magneto provides software to design and operate online stores and payments. Uh, they also manage the shipping and returns that go along with that. And Marketo is, uh, it makes marketers uh, get more relevant information and it personalizes stuff and engages uh, promotions. It's a marketing and business-to-business -business software. And from these purchases, there's no impairment to So we were asked kind of like what their relationship with Microsoft is, and they've had a very long, friendly relationship with Microsoft. Uh, compared with Apple, with Apple they've been kind of off and on, whether they agree, disagree, work together, don't like each other. But with Microsoft it's been very stable. They've even been uh, deepening the cloud computing partnership as of this year they came up with that. And one, two major things that happened with this um, is Microsoft agreed to incorporate the Adobe Experience, which is one of their segments, into the Dynamics 365 and Office 365 in LinkedIn and Azure. And then they also chose Adobe as their preferred signature solution, which is pretty significant um, in the market. And this gives uh, Adobe an edge against many of their uh, the cloud computing space, uh, competitors of Amazon and Alphabet. So the change of business model was one thing that um, we wanted to talk about. So in 2012, Adobe made the adjustment from a one-time purchase to a monthly subscription. Both the customers and the uh, business, Adobe, liked this, as customers could choose the programs they wanted for the price they wanted. Um, of course, the longer that they committed to Adobe, the cheaper subscription they got. And while they, they quit offering the the creative suite after the sixth edition, which was the one-time purchase, and moved to what they call the creative cloud, which is the monthly subscription for services. Um, part of the reason why they said this was good for them is because with the creative suite, they would get lump sum payments when new updates came out because people would upgrade. But with the uh, creative cloud, they had monthly reoccurring revenue, which was better for So their business segments are divided into three. Of digital media, which is professional digital imaging, drawing, illustrating products, so making flyers and posters and banners. The digital experience, which is providing customers with exceptional digital experiences, managing advertising, and helping businesses obtain deep intelligence about their customers. And then publishing, so e-learning solutions, technical document publishing, web publishing, and web conferencing. So some of the products that they offer in these segments, um, the digital media segment, they have the Creative Cloud, which we talked about, which is their monthly subscription to all their uh, apps and services. Then they have the Acrobat in uh, Adobe Document Cloud, which gives a complete portfolio of digital document solutions. And then they have the Adobe Experience Cloud. Um, that includes the 
the advertising cloud, analytics cloud, marketing cloud, and Magento or Magneto uh, commerce cloud. So this helps businesses sort the noise and figure out what is actually good for them. Um, plus it gives real-time insights into their actions and helps them manage content and their assets. And then Magneto offers digital commerce and brings it all together um, as one and offers predictive intelligence and basically makes uh, Adobe a one-stop shop for uh, design businesses. So the future of Adobe, while they did purchase Marketo and Magneto that are not the bread and butter of Adobe, they do help round out the company as a whole. So they also announced uh, new partnerships with ServiceNow. This is enhancing their real-time customer profiles with their support data and with Microsoft and LinkedIn using account-based experiences through data integration, marketing plus sales capabilities. They also unveiled a new generation of their Sensei AI. They are AI machine learning technology embedded into the Adobe Experience Cloud. They also announced that they will preview new technology in the future and it will come out of this R&D lab, so they're actively making new things. And so Adobe, while well, a lot of people are familiar with it because it, sometimes it can come like pre-installed or you can use it once before, they're also really big in trying to give back to the community so they're not just trying to make money. And so they match employee donations of up to $10,000 a year and they encourage employees to volunteer which they give out grants for $250 every 10 hours of service. They matched about almost 9 million employee donations, and globally their employees volunteered 15,000 hours. And maybe this isn't super important to their stock information, but this is how the community is seeing Adobe as it interacts with them as a company. So for the comparables, we have Adobe, Microsoft, Autodesk, SAP, Oracle, and we put in Synopsys because we already own Synopsys in our portfolio, as well as Microsoft. Uh, Autodesk is probably the closest one that does the exact same thing to Adobe, but SAP, Oracle, Synopsys, and Microsoft have the most similar business models. And some of these are listed as competitors in general on their 10K, and um, yeah, like, uh, Autodesk has a suite of programs that they sell as well, which is uh, pretty similar to the business model. Autodesk is just a smaller company. So it looks like they want to be Adobe. Like right? Yeah, like you pulled it up. So. so this is how Adobe is uh, compared to the tech sector and the S&P 500. It matches them mostly for uh, volatility, the ups and downs, but it is way outperforming everything. So. Of course, the beta. And their beta is actually fairly low. So as far as its volatility compared to the market, it's not as high as what we would expect it from a tech company. Usually tech companies are more volatile. So the target price we came up with, um, oh, I'm sorry, I did change the really big number, $313. And this is because the original numbers we had both FCFF and FCFE together. And we chose FCFF because of the varying debt levels that Adobe has when looking back through their 10K, and that's because they paid a lot of it off. Um, the relative valuation we used the forward 12 months PE, and we weighted both of them at 50%. So the current price is $293, and Bloomberg actually gave us a target price, which we just wanted to show you, but didn't include in the weighting of $317. So we were pretty happy with our. 313. And I this is a little recognize bit what that you that have is on different the because of remembering this morning that we needed to choose FCFF or FCFE. So okay. tried to fix but not on print. Okay. Uh, so some of the risks. Um, some of the risks with Adobe is that not all subscribers are created equal. Adobe will list all their subscribers, but some of them are paying $50 a month and some of them are paying five or ten. If you buy a uh, photo app or Photoshop app on your phone, you're not paying $50 to use it, but Adobe's still counting you as a subscriber. So their subscribers are going up. Uh, it's not the most useful metric in deciding how well Adobe is doing with their revenue. 
There is also very large uh, competition in the digital market. Competitors like Salesforce, IBM, and Oracle pose really big threats in going after the same customers um, in the market share with digital marketing, while Adobe, though, does have completely dominant creative process softwares. And right now, a lot of articles think that Adobe is overvalued, or they think the projections are a little too high. And they thought this also back in 2015 and 2012, and the stock has only continued to go up. So while there is the risk that maybe we think it's doing too well, they have thought that it was doing too well for the past five years, and has been totally fine. The stock increased almost 300% since 2015, when a lot of articles came out and said, is Adobe too big? And, no. <laughs> So some of the news that um, this came out, so Adobe just released a Photoshop app for iPad. Um, it works with a lot of the fancy Apple features like the pencil. And right now the way that they're getting customers is they, with a free download, they give you a 30-day trial. And then after that, it's basically a $10 subscription to the Creative Cloud after. And they have had problems. Uh, right after this came out, a lot of Apple users were dissatisfied with it. It wasn't working quite well but we felt that the news really showed that Adobe is continuing to branch into iOS software. It's not just sticking with Microsoft. It wants to be the creative product for every application. And since then, too, they've came out with updates trying to address the issues that many of their customers bring up. Um, and Adobe will no longer use Flash Player at the end of 2020. This is a little bit of old news as they announced it for a while, but um, after, at the end of 2020, they will no longer be supported. But the use of Flash Player, since it was announced by Adobe, uh, Google, Microsoft, um, someone else, it was back in 2016 or 15 when they said that they were going to completely phase it out. And between two years, the use of Flash Player on computers dropped from 86% to 12 So Flash phasing out is not a big deal at all. It's already been agreed upon and happening. And it's seen as a new move to the future of technology. And in 2020, the Creative Cloud is going to come out with their new edition, which is updates and new versions of all the apps that they offer. Um, they've been optimizing Adobe software for live streaming. This is their way of trying to get creators to connect and to debut their creations, creating more of a community environment. And then the company is also focused on improving the mobile experience, um, especially with the signing process. And this has a lot to do with Microsoft naming them their preferred signing. Um, that gives them a lot of horsepower in the electronic process. And so some of the catalysts, uh, 3D design is becoming more popular than web pages. And, and 3D design is very uh, impactful on AR and VR. And Adobe has a program called Adobe Dimensions, and this tackles the 3D designing. Um, smart data is something that uh, the majority of consumers want and value highly. And Adobe has been actively partnering Companies like Microsoft to um, enhance their data so it uh, encompasses everything that they can provide. And so Adobe came out and had a presentation to investors about how customer service is becoming even more significant, and only one in ten businesses see themselves as very advanced in that customer service um, uh, branch. And increasing customer service leads to increasing revenues. And the Adobe digital experience segment is focused on increasing the customer experience. And increasing the use of mobile apps, especially in the service industry, and again, that can go back to Microsoft choosing Adobe as their preferred signing um, of documents. So do they consider themselves advanced at customer service? They do, yes. But Adobe is also capitalizing on other companies thinking that they're not good at customer service, and them saying, here, we can help you. And can you go back one slide? Mm -hmm. So you said Adobe <laughs> released their uh, 2020 Creative Cloud already? Or um, they're going to release? I believe they released it. Okay. So how are they going to absorb Marketo and the other company that seems to have varying pronunciation? I know. <laughs> 
Yes, those two. Because <laughs> um, it seems like it's a little bit of a pivot from their uh, products, their kind of core product offering. They bought them to increase themselves, not so much to have them to distribute to other people. They were very large acquisitions, about six and a half billion in total, which is a little bit over their yearly revenue. Yeah, it's a so how are those going to be, are they going to be integrated into other Adobe products? Or are they going to be kept separately? So I know Magneto, um, yeah, um, they are part of the digital experience segment. Um, they're being incorporated with the customer service and the satisfaction. Um, they're incorporated in that segment. I didn't see anything in the 10K about how they were incorporating Marketo too. There in any other segments, it didn't explicitly state where they were incorporated. Okay. Um, so you you highlight the decrease in debt, but looking just at the three years of information you have here, it looks like debt increased significantly in 2018, and then is just being brought down. I mean, further further drawn down than 2017, but it looks like there was actually quite a big bump up of debt in 2018, and I don't know if that's acquisition related or what, but I probably want to see kind of longer term information and see where they're kind of anticipating keeping their capital structure. Um, what growth rates did you use to kind of to model for your free cash flow to the firm? Okay, so you have a sales growth rate of 30%, which is above the 23%. Because we believe they're increasing their revenue, so we'll continue into the next year. We also uh, changed the non-cash working capital since it was a negative 40, and that's because they did have that uh, extreme debt payout. So we took 27%, which was their non-cash working capital percentage in 2018, we felt. 2017 and 18, those numbers were more similar than the negative 40. So, I think the sales growth estimate there might be a little bit aggressive because that seems to be higher than the guidance that management themselves are providing. Okay. So you might want to make sure you're double checking that before just bumping it up 7%. That's a lot. Um, so I'd look into maybe their, the SG&A assumptions and the sales growth assumptions and kind of check those against, because um, you can see both analyst estimates as well as management guidance in the Bloomberg. So I'd probably take a double check and make sure your assumptions are kind of in line um, and not too aggressive there. Where does this fit in our portfolio? technology. So what would you get rid of? We would get rid of Cognizant. So they have a really high uncertainty now and a couple news articles that we found just looking into them to see what was going on is that they're going to lay off uh, 12,000 mid to senior level associates globally to fund new investments. This was published in October of this year. And while 12,000 isn't that much compared to the overall employee number of Cognizant, their mid to senior level associates that are being fired to be able to have money to do new investments, which means that they don't have enough money to invest already. They need to cut to be able to do more, and that's not very, uh, doesn't look very positive. And so their EPS for the quarter three, um, 13% lower than what the analyst predicted. 
and it came in at 90 cents of EPS for the third quarter. And then another major thing that we came across was Cognizant was part of a bribery scheme from 2014 to 2016 to acquire government uh, construction permits and licenses, and I believe it was in India. Mm -hmm. And in February of 2019, they agreed to pay $25 million in damages because of this uh, bribery scheme that they were caught up in. And then looking at the insider cells, there have been 251 cells in the past 12 months and only one buy for the people inside their own company and their own stock. So it doesn't look like there's a lot of faith from inside cognizant of their own company and stock. So. Okay. Questions from the class on either the sell or buy recommendation? For Adobe, did you guys come across anything about their like software getting hacked or scammed at all? Yeah, there was one article that talked about how they were breached and that they did uh, people did take some information from them. But um, I think that's something that a lot of tech companies have to deal with. It's just part of the. I said just because like a couple of years ago I like downloaded it for a class Adobe something and I got like scammed like sixty bucks. Really? Had to, like, get it. So I was just wondering. Like, you downloaded the raw yeah, Adobe? I don't know, it was like yeah. three bucks a month or something, but they charged me like 60. So I was just wondering. I haven't heard about that specifically, but, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, we did want to mention, too, Adobe <coughs> has absolutely zero litigations yeah. right now. So, that's always nice to see in a company. So... When I think about Adobe kind of in broader strokes, they have this set of like software that they provide that has this niche audience like for creative people, creative professionals. Um, like Adobe is kind of like the dominant product line. So they do have some strength there um, to kind of continue growing. Uh, I think it's probably, I mean, the, that creative suite of products is probably a somewhat limited audience with a willingness to pay for that. So it's growing like the, the kind of general business use and other use kind of products. So some of their acquisitions are kind of interesting because it does seem like it's a little bit of a pivot from their core product line now um, and pro like some possibility for cross-selling. Um, the reason why I asked you to compare it to Microsoft is because this is kind of like a big old slightly not not to say slightly boring technology company but yeah slightly boring like they are large uh and corporate and perhaps somewhat staid and bureaucratic um <laughs> and so not to say that that's a bad thing necessarily um i use some negative terminology there calling it bureaucratic um, but I mean, it's nice to see that they're profitable versus a lot of technology companies that aren't, um, that people are very excited about just future growth prospects. You see some real data here. Um, but to me, it kind of fits lar squarely in this category of like very large technology companies. I would want to understand their plans a little bit better to see how they sustain such a high growth rate, um, past a couple of years from now. So. That's where I would want to be convinced, personally. What's funny is we actually uh, chose like Adobe out of the stock screener because we thought, oh, Adobe's old, it's big, maybe this is like a value company we could invest in. And as we looked into it, it actually turned into be more of a growth stock as we read more articles. About it, so. so, I think people conflate like large companies or at least in this class, like people look at large companies a lot because there's a, a sense of security or safety in picking a brand name you know. Um, but large companies tend not to provide the best value um, overall, generally, because everybody has the same sense of security in, a br in brand names they know. Um, so if you're really looking for value, you have to sometimes dig a little deeper and look at uh, smaller companies. Um, I'm not dissuading you from buying growth companies or buying large companies necessarily, especially because we benchmark ourselves against a portfolio of large companies. Um, but when you do look for value in a large company, it oftentimes has to be either a company in a sector that's really 
the, like, like a, maybe the overall sector kind of has limited growth expectations. Um, like I think you can probably find like large value in like utilities maybe. <laughs> um, so there's maybe some industry expectations there to counteract that size. Um, or you have to look for a company that maybe just has like a temporarily tarnished reputation. That's typically how you find value in these extremely large companies. So I don't think Adobe necessarily fits that profile. Okay?